Hello, hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to our 47th Pachacacha show and our second virtual Portland PK show. Tonight we are thrilled to be with you. Thank you for tuning in, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or our website. We so appreciate you joining us live tonight and we are excited. Our mission here at Pecha Kucha Portland is to enrich, to inspire, to build and support the main community through the sharing of passionate and personal stories. Tonight, you'll be hearing just that, beautiful, personal, inspiring stories from our five presenters. We are part of the global Pachacucha network of cities and towns. And we stay in line, keeping to the 20 by 20 creative storytelling format. For those of you who are totally new to Pachacacha, welcome. I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory. In 2003, it was the brainchild of architects Mark Dytham and Astrid Klein, who wanted to streamline their colleagues' presentations because they were going on and on. And that was in Tokyo. And that was the birth of PK nights or Pachakacha nights. And from then, from that moment in 2003, PK nights have grown into a global phenomenon. They now happen in over 140 countries, 1,200 cities around the globe. Here in Portland, Maine, we've been hosting PK nights since 2007. And um, we couldn't be more pleased that you're joining us tonight. Pachakacha means chit chat in Japanese, and we are a networking uh, event. And if you're on a social media platform where you can comment, we encourage you to do that. Let us know what moves you tonight. Let us know what surprises you. Give us feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And you can always contact us as well through our website, pechakuchaportland.org. Man, we could not ask for a more global night than the one we have in store for you with our lineup of presenters. They are our neighbors, friends, and colleagues who hail from all corners of the globe and who reside in Portland, Maine. They offer us stories of hope, of surprise, of personal growth, of finding home, of letting go, of empowerment, of, of celebration. And I am confident that our presenters tonight will awe and inspire you. Tonight would not be possible without the generous help of the Greater Portland Immigrant Welcome Center, which really helped our volunteer board connect with many of our presenters tonight. So we want to extend a big warm thank you to Reza Jalali, the executive director, of the Greater Portland Immigrant Welcome Center. And this center serves as a hub of collaboration that strengthens the immigrant community through language acquisition, economic integration, and civic engagement here in Portland, Maine. Thank you. And now uh, a word from uh, other organizations without whom we could not put on tonight's show. These are our sponsors. So we're gonna hear a brief message from our spon uh, about our sponsors and then we'll come back and jump right into our presentations. Our presenting sponsor is Greg Bolas and Family. Outstanding commercial real estate developers and brokers longtime friend of Maine's creative organizations and endeavors. Thank you so much, Greg. Our media partner, Avenue Media, is a production company based here in Portland, Maine, providing multi-camera live video capture, web streaming, editing, and conversion with production solutions to meet the needs of all types of events. AvenueMedia.us. Greater Good Marketing is a brand development consultancy and integrated business development firm. Simply put, our mission is to help purpose-driven organizations achieve great things. Visit us at greatergoodworks.com. 
Nia, a fitness experience that blends martial arts with dance and mindfulness. Find joy and tap into your creativity while getting a great workout. Learn more at erincurran.com. Klein Dytham Architecture, creators of Pachacacha, is a multidisciplinary design practice known for architecture, interiors, public spaces, and installations. And lastly, Creative Portland is the fiscal sponsor for Pechacucha Portland. Creative Portland's mission is to support the creative economy through the arts by providing essential resources, by fostering partnerships, and by promoting Portland's artistic talents and cultural assets. Hello and welcome back. A big thank you to all of our sponsors tonight. Without further ado, we are going to jump right into our presentations with our first presenter, Marfine Chan. Marfine Chan is a Portland-based thinker, Portland, Maine-based thinker, writer, educator, and speaker on social justice, equity, and inclusion. As a gay first-generation Asian American born in California to a Cambodian refugee family and later adopted by an evangelical white working class family in Maine, Marfine uses a mix of humor and storytelling to help people view topics such as racism, xenophobia, and homophobia through an intersectional lens. Marfine is the Development, Communications, and Education Associate at the Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine. Marfine holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the University of Southern Maine and a law degree, though he does not practice law, from the University of Maine School of Law. Please join me in welcoming Marfine Chan with his presentation, Welcome Home. Good evening. 2020 hasn't been much of a year for traveling, but if you happen to cross from New Hampshire into Maine, you'll see the iconic Welcome to Maine sign, which now includes the phrase Welcome Home. But today I want to focus less on the words and more on the space between those words, the space that connects their respective meanings, the space and spaces we call home, not physical homes, but the idea of home and how we build it and fill it and share it with others. And to help understand where I'm coming from, I'd like to share a little bit about my story. What does home mean for the immigrant, the refugee, the asylum seeker? Like so many families that have come to these shores over the centuries, my family has had to wrestle with this question. My mother especially, struggled with this question. She spent a good portion of her early childhood and adolescence running from the Khmer Rouge and living in a refugee camp in Thailand. When she came to the United States with my grandmother and gave birth to me in the California hospital, imagine the questions she faced. Someone who had no stable definition of home was not a provider home to a child. And from that day to the day we were put in foster care here in Maine, she struggled being at home and providing a home for her children. My early childhood years were spent mostly with my godparents and my grandmother, who welcomed me as if I was their own son into their family. They had two daughters, and to this day, they still consider me their only son. One day, when I was four or so years old, my godfather sat me down and said that they were moving to Texas. But rather than taking me along with him, he gave me a choice. Do you wanna stay with your mom or do you wanna go with us? I chose to stay with my mom. Whichever choice I made would have been a painful one. But no matter what, no matter how often I was shuttled back and forth between her and my God family and my grandmother, she was still my mother. Do you wanna go with us? When I was five years old, my mother and my sister Tanya and I followed my grandmother and aunts and uncles across the country to Portland, Maine. When she came to the United States with my grandmother and gave birth to me in a California hospital, imagine the questions she faced.
home, the idea of it was a lot different for me back then. My first language was Cambodian. The foods I ate were my Cambodian grandmother and mother's food. The religion I observed was that of my Cambodian parents and grandparents and ancestors. How I created and filled the space of home and what it meant to be welcomed there stood on the shoulders of the culture that my biological family passed down to me. But this all came crashing down. Things got worse for my mom as she continued to struggle to the point where the state intervened. In 1999, me and my sister Tanya were given black trash bags. We were asked to fill the space with our precious items and belongings. We arrived at our first foster home in Acton, our eyes red and bloated from all the crying on the way there, now started to brim with tears again as we shuffled under the front deck, then quickly into our new rooms as we started to sob again, forced to sleep in a stranger's home. We were introduced to new foods, new routines, and the concept of chores and allowance. Overnight, we were introduced to a new religion, Christianity. I learned, you know, what a handshake was, and my foster father taught me the message a firm handshake sent. The space around me was new and strange, and it shook the foundations of the space that I had created and called home up until that point. Surrounded by whiteness, I began to push my Cambodian identity away. To survive, I thought, I needed to become like the snow. I needed to become whiter, but I couldn't because my skin was brown like the earth. As the year went on, the strange space we were brought to began to fill with smiles, laughter, shouting matches, timeouts, memories. The very white elementary school that my sister and I attended organized a school-wide Cambodian New Year's celebration. And I came home that day, home to my foster parents, proud to be Cambodian. I began to reconcile my identity as Cambodian and as American, as a son of refugees and as a foster son. But that fragile peace was disrupted when we were forced to move to a group home, then another foster home. The physical spaces around me changed so many times that my internal space, my identity, my idea of home was in disarray. In 2003, my sister and I were reunited with our two younger siblings and two years later adopted into one family in 2005. Our adoptive family were devout Christians and we went to church every Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday evening. It was a lot of church. Church was our home. But even though I considered my family in these spaces home, there was a struggle unfolding in the space inside of me. As adolescence dawned on me and my body began to grow and fill more space, a piece of me, a part of my identity was trying to blossom, to push out of the dark space where I hid it under a bushel. I was gay, but I didn't want to be because I knew I couldn't be. I knew that this would not be welcome news to the world around me. The people who I looked up to and tried to please were clear in their mind, own minds at least that being gay was a sin. It was an abomination. It was against the natural order that God had ordained. I struggled with this cognitive dissonance throughout middle school and high school, of wanting to make my adoptive family proud and being the best Christian I could be, but also hiding my being gay. It wasn't until a cold winter night while I was attending Valley Forge Christian College, what I call my winter at Valley Forge, that I decided to be true to myself. When I came home that summer, I decided the long, I started the long journey of coming out to my friends and family. I started to fill and create the space in me and around me with my authentic self, my Cambodian self, my gay self, and it led to me being a community leader and president of the Cambodian Community Association. So I close by saying, home is a space you create and fill over time with memories and cherished moments. Home is a space inside of you, not just around you. Home is a space between you and someone else and everyone else. Home, in a sense, is where there's no boundary between where you are and who you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marfine Chan, for that moving story of how you came to Maine and the intersections of your life just unfolding one after the other. It's amazing what we learn about each other when we ask about each other's stories and really listen. Beautiful. Thank you so much. 
Claudette Daye Nina Haze is our next presenter. Claudette is a business development consultant and cultural broker who has extensive experience in intercultural communications for both for profit and nonprofit sectors. As executive director of In Her Presence, she sits on multiple boards in Portland and is deeply connected to community-based initiatives across the city. As a community leader who has herself gone through the immigration process, she has a unique ability to anticipate challenges new Mainers face and utilizes her professional expertise to empower people and communities a highly proficient negotiator, both intuitive and resourceful. Claudette collaborates with executive leadership in businesses to develop organizational capacity and culture to promote opportunities for new Mainer success. She is the senior consultant at Integrative Inquiry and is a graduate of the University of Burundi with a bachelor's degree in administration and management. Please welcome Claudette Dayini Nahaze with Letting Go. Hello, everybody. Process of letting go. Letting go of your hopes, your dreams, the future you thought was just around the corner. Letting go of your job, your school, your home. Imagine letting go of everything that is familiar to you, your language, your culture, the way you gather for a meal with your family and friends, the taste of your favorite food, the sound of your neighborhood as it wakes in the morning. Imagine letting go of all that you hold precious and that which sustain you, your wife, your husband, your parents, grandparents, cousins, aunts, uncles, your child. Imagine letting go. That's a moment of darkness no one can ever, ever, ever forget. I was going to live in a foreign country with a different and very cold weather, with no family and friend to hold your hands, but the language was really the one intimidating me. I had fear instead of hope. I had survival thoughts instead in of dreams. I was born in Burundi, a small country in the heart of Africa. After the passing of my mom, I moved to Bujumbura and lived to my, uh, with my old sister. She taught me two things I've always taken with me. You can lose everything, but you will never lose your education. Telling the truth and building relationship is the key. Leaving my native country was a challenge. Arriving in the US, it was swimming in the sea without uh, any direction. I felt relief with the promise of safety. I was really a tree, hope planted in a vast desperate desert. With mountains of snow around me, I felt so tiny as I walked to the general assistant. Crying and disorienting, I kept questioning myself why I left and I felt really the safety and of my family. Months after, the summer came and I felt a glance of hope. I started remembering the sun from Lake uh, back home, the breeze for Lake Tanganyika. The hope was the only thing which kept me going. Little did I know, what was waiting for me. I applied to many companies hoping to get into the brewing industry again, but I never received a call. I don't learn the harsh reality of an immigrant. My degree means nothing. My only way was to work as a housekeeper. After getting my bachelor degree, I worked as a national sales manager for Heineken and I was in danger and moved to the United States for my safety. I was hired at Main Med. Shame covered me every day as I walked into the building and my self-esteem dropped. I felt rejected by society. Although my self-esteem was uh, down, my ambition kept really going. 
I realized that someone needs to stand up for others, reached out to Mickey Bondo and in her presence was born. That was my first milestone. Most women are isolated in the community. It's all started by a yoga class back in 2015. It was a way for, to feel strong, a way to learn to cope the, for the stress, to get to know each other, share experiences, build community and grow together. Leaving my native country was a challenge. Turning behind, there was an impotence. Moving, moving forward, the door was locked. The only choice was to stand up and unlock the door. Without the language, nothing you can do. In her presence became the catalyst for change, illuminating and bringing women from the shadow into the stage to overcome isolation, build a relationship, and bridge the cross-cultural communication to break the silence. Women are the pilot of the family. They have everything on their shoulder, but they don't reach out for help. You cannot be strong alone. We need to be together. If women are empowered and feel integrated in the community, the whole family will follow. Toting the slogan out of the shadow and to the stage, women start the new journey with the language improvement, empowerment, and community involvement. Women increase their confidence, build relationship, trust, and raise their voices. And now we have a platform of around 100 women coming from 16 different countries and speaking more than 12 languages. We grew from only two volunteers in 2015 to more than 46 in 2020. We brought the vision and mission to the larger community, increasing visibility within immigrant community. Today, we are facing a collective loss together with the pandemic and the uprising of, of the pain, the grief and trauma in the street. We are standing to the injustice. We are the bridge for the community because of experience, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. We recognize the missing voice, become ambassador, build a clear vision and pathway to overcome challenge and change and uh, transformation. Telling you the moment of my childhood, my work, the source of my courage to stand up. When I say I believe in community and empowerment, it's not abstract to me. It's literally how I was grew up. That's the lesson I was really implemented in my DNA. It's part of my blood that pumps through my heart even today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudette. What a powerful example you are of overcoming challenge and then not only helping yourself, but so many others to overcome their challenge and how in unity we are stronger. What a beautiful story. Thank you so much for doing the work you do in the world and for being a part of our night tonight. Beautiful. Our next presenter is named Viva Banga. Viva Banga is a South Sudanese dancer. Since the age of 12, dancing hip hop every Friday, she has honed a passion for sharing her cultural dance with people locally. She is a talented dancer who has an opportunity to play with a mix of styles in Afrobeat that can offer a different approach to dance in Maine. She has taught at local studios like Hustle and Flow, Bright Star World Dance, Living Room Dance Collective, Portland Youth Dance, Mayo Street Arts, and many more. Here is Viva Banga and her presentation, Dancing with Purpose. When I was 12 years old, I decided I wanted to be an actor. Why? Because the thought of adopting a different life fascinated me. I asked my parents to enroll me in classes, and they did. I took multiple classes every week for three months, but then my parents couldn't afford my classes anymore, 
so I had to take a break from them. I took an outreach hip hop class at Mayo Street Arts, but I didn't look at myself as a dancer. I just wanted to add something interesting to my acting resume. Students from Casco Bay Movers came to teach us dance, and soon I wanted to be a part of Casco Bay Movers as well. And so I auditioned and I got in. I was among the few students who received a scholarship to dance there, and it felt great to be there. I was dancing at a real studio with tall mirrors and nice floors, and for the first time after a year of classes, I felt like a dancer. I look back at the time and think of how fortunate I was to be able to join despite finances. Giving kids opportunities to pursue activities they like can have a major impact on their lives. Outreach programs have the capability of sparking a flame within the kids they reach, and I'm a walking example of just that. After my departure at Cascaway Movers at age 16, I joined a group of girls who were practicing Afrobeat dance. Afrobeat dance is a mix of African, jazz, and hip hop moves. This group felt like home because the dance we did was my home. We were called pseudo girls. Together, we danced and had conversations on how we could benefit our country, South Sudan, which is where most of us were born. I'm so proud of all the things we accomplished as a group. We made it on the news, performed for universities, and even met the South Sudanese ambassador. Being with pseudo girls gave me a sense of identity. I wasn't only learning to dance, but I was learning to dance for a purpose. Dancing no longer was just a cool thing for me to add to my resume, but it was inspiring, exciting, and it had substance. At this point, I wanted to be a dancer. My reason for dancing was spreading awareness about my country, South Sudan, and wanting to make a change in the situation, no matter how big or small. When I performed with pseudo girls, I used lots of energy because I wanted the audience to feel my energy and the passion I had for my country. I like having a reason to dance. That's what pushes me when I get tired. I found myself practicing for hours straight and started building the strong passion for dance that I still have today. Everything was leading to where I am now. When I started dancing at Mayo Street Arts, I didn't anticipate how deep I would fall in love with it. Everything that happened was good preparation. I was a student for many years before I became a teacher. And I never thought I'd become a dance teacher, but life just guides you a certain way. After I graduated high school, I became a dance teacher. At first it was part-time, but then I decided I wanted to focus all my attention on teaching dance. So I quit my day job and decided to focus all my attention on dancing. It felt right and I enjoyed doing it. There's a difference between being a dancer and being a dance teacher. Being a dancer is all about you, but being a dance teacher is all about the students. All my attention was geared towards the students when I teach. Do they like the dance? Is it too hard? Did I go over the same thing too many times? But the most important question I ask myself is, does it look like they're having fun? And that's the only question that really matters. My purpose when I teach dance is to create fun for my students. Dancing is silly and it can feel embarrassing when you mess up sometimes, but it's also kind of funny at the same time. When I teach classes to kids, it takes me back to when I started dancing. When I teach outreach dance to kids, it feels like home because that's exactly where my dance journey began. These classes define my purpose for me and they motivate me to keep on dancing. That motivation pushed me to start Dance for a Nonprofit. I offer a 20 to 30 minute pre-recorded online class and all the proceeds go towards a nonprofit. I get the luxury of dancing with a purpose, but also offering that to others as well. The first nonprofit that I partnered with is Kutoa Africa. They're focused on assisting young girls in Liberia. Their mission is to raise awareness for child protection and education in African communities. This was an organization that touched 
me really deeply and hit home. It makes me feel delighted to know I have a reason to dance. It's something I've thought about and hadn't bit of figured out how I could do it. Though this pandemic has brought a lot of pain and stress for everyone, I came up with something that I probably wouldn't have thought of without the pandemic. I get to teach dance for a purpose, and the students learn also with the purpose. It's the best way for me to share what I like to do and why, and hopefully inspire another student to do the same. When I dance, I give it my all, and I hope that others can feel that. I want others to feel my energy when I dance, because I love to dance. I look forward to when things go back to normal, but I'm also grateful for what has already come and what it has brought. There's a little bit of light in the darkness that we've been going through. Thank you. Wow, Viva, thank you so much. I love your energy and I love how you pass on that gift of your energy and enthusiasm for movement and dance to others and how we can all benefit through your generosity. Beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for being a part of this night. I've heard that on Facebook, the comments are streaming. If you wanna connect with like-minded viewers who are engaged in this show tonight, go ahead and add your two cents to the stream. See who else is watching on Facebook or YouTube and do a little of that chit chat <laughs> virtually. It's what we're named for after all, pachakacha chit chat in Japanese. We will move on to our next presenter, Ebenezer Akakpo. By way of contrast, Ebenezer Akakpo's portfolio spans various mediums and processes. When combined with the visual language symbols or adinkra symbols from his native Ghana, he presents a unique collection of ideas and creations. His jewelry making passion led him to Le Arte Orafe in Florence, Italy, where he studied stone setting and jewelry design. While in Italy, Ebenezer discovered the world of computer-aided design and manufacturing and became fascinated by its incredible potential to change jewelry making in the future. He moved to the U.S. and studied metal smithing and jewelry at the Maine College of Art here in Portland, Maine, and industrial design at Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. In 2017, he founded the Akakpo Design Group in Maine, focusing on designing jewelry, apparel, and home accessories. He also founded Maine Culture Apparel. He serves as creative director at both businesses. Please join me in welcoming Ebenezer Akakpo with his presentation, Connecting the Detours. <laughs> As a child in Ghana, I could never have predicted the path of my future. Today, I know the only way to understand who we are is to connect the dots backwards to the event that made us. Every item I design carry pieces of my cultural history, skills and techniques of my education, and the passion I carry for performing social justice. They are meant to remind us to, to remain open to every experience life brings us. They each have significance in who we become. I have always been fascinated with the power of lines, symbols, and designs. 
My father was an architect and knew the importance of education. I will never forget him telling me the only legacy he can give me as a son is education. He said, I can give you a car and the car can crash. I can give you a house and the house can bend down. But with education, you can go anywhere in this world and you will survive. In school, I was encouraged to explore the way things were made, fixed and created out of nothing. I was intent on following in my father's footsteps. However, he had plans for me. He had other plans for me. I was to become a jewelry designer. Skeptical, I followed the advice of my father who turned out to be right. With components of line designs, small scale buildings, calculations involving math and chemistry, my apprenticeship at a local goldsmiths as a jewelry designer solidified my love and passion of the craft. That was just the beginning of a long path that has led me to places both geographical and educational, and I could have never anticipated. In Florence, Italy, I received a formal education in jewelry design stone setting at Le Arte Orafe, where I learned the importance of symbols in paying homage to our history and culture. At the main College of Arts, I earned my Bachelor's of Fine Arts, I earned my Bachelor's of Fine Arts in metal smithing and jewelry, and was challenged to work in new mediums and expand my artistic range of fields of drawing and sculpture. Earning certifications in computer technology and working in this field for a while gave me the confidence I could master the role of combining the world of technology with art and industrial design. I earned my Master's of Fine Arts in Industrial Design at Rochester Institute of Technology. Design can often be misinterpreted as luxury for the wealthy. I attended a show titled Design for the 90% of the World Population at the Cooper Hewitt Museum, at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. I left the show questioning who are the other 90%? To my dismay, Luxury design companies target only 10% of the world population to buy their products, since the other 90% are considered to have little or no access to most of the products and services many of us take for granted, such as food, clean water, or shelter. The whole experience strengthened my conviction that design can be used as a tool to solve many of the world's problems. The creation of the Akako line has allowed me to combine multifaceted educational experiences with this desire to affect positive change. I am able to use the traditional symbols of my Ghanaian heritage to create pieces of art that carry personal and cultural power. After designing a portable filtration system with B9 plastic to purify water for people in developing countries, as well as people of my native Ghana, I decided to commit 70% of the proceeds from my Emeco collection to continue to support the Better Water Maker project that I helped launch. Today, I'm in a unique place because of the many directions my path has pointed me in. And I count myself blessed every day that my path has led me here it is only looking back 
that we can appreciate how the many experiences of our lives created the people we have become. Years ago, at the main College of Arts, I remember being frustrated, having to participate in classes I deemed not important or worth my time. At the end of the term slash year, one of my professors, Tracy Cockrell, called me to her office to discuss my experiences thus far. Since the year was coming to an end, we had a lengthy chat. One piece of advice she offered, which I am happy to say I have kept with me till today, is I know you are frustrated with all the other classes you don't want to take. And you wish you were only taking jewelry making classes. But you have to let go, free your mind, and allow yourself to learn new things. Otherwise, another year will come to end and you have you feel like you have wasted your time. After our long chat, as I was heading out of the door, she reaffirmed everything we talked about in one sentence. She concluded by saying, and this I also say to you, let go and take on new experiences. Otherwise you will learn nothing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ebenezer, that was wonderful. I'm uh, so inspired by how all of our presenters tonight, not only, you know, are, are so creative and productive, but generous in spirit and passing on the gifts, um, whether it's profits, um, creativity, empowerment, it's just amazing to me, these stories. Um, I hope that you're feeling as inspired as I am and maybe feeling like you'd want to get involved in a future Pachakacha night. You can find out how to do that by going to our website, pechacuchaportland.org. Become a volunteer, a presenter, a sponsor. There are so many ways to get involved and we would love for you to be a part of our future nights. Our final presenter of the evening is Karem Durda. Karem says that he has an inherent bias towards action. He is a firm believer and practitioner of conscious capitalism. We've heard a bit about that tonight, I think, and B corporations. His important day job is not what I'm focusing on tonight, he likes to call himself a witness to humanity, quoting the E.E. E. Cummings poem, which I'll quote a little bit of right now. Carry your heart with me. I carry it in my heart. I am never without it. Anywhere I go, you go, my dear. And whatever is done by me, only me, is your doing. Karam carries many things in his heart. And if you want to know more about him, Google him, find him on LinkedIn, read his poems, ask him about his favorite movies, books, bands, and maybe, just maybe, he'll be brave enough to tell you what is in his heart. Please join me in welcoming Karem Durda with Dervish Travels on Streets of Jasmine Trees. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. Thank you. Ding. What is home? I'm not sure. It is ever elastic, ever shifting constant for me. A dervish song on Jasmine streets. I have been an immigrant all my life, all my life. Born in Karachi, Pakistan of Turkish parents. Born and raised till I came to the United States when I was 17 and a half. Karachi, I'm a Karachi boy, I'm Pakistani. The sun, playing cricket on the streets, the mass of humanity of eight, 15, 18 million souls. I think about it on the quiet days, Hawks Bay Beach, biking all over the place, taking the rickshaw to go all over the city. My mother telling me to be back by home by dark, be home by dark. Karachi, is it home? I think it is. Where I grew up, poems of Faiz Ahmed Faiz, Munir Niazi fell in love gloriously twice, gloriously was so damn lucky to go to Karachi Grammar School for 13 years where I lived and I lived and I lived. You know those days where the universe was wide open, wide open and the days never ended? 
the days when I dribbled the ball in field hockey. I remember Hassan Sardar. I ran and ran and ran on the right wing. I was 14. Got the call to try out for the Junior National Olympic field hockey team. Find out pretty quick that I can't be a Pakistani citizen because in order to do so, both your parents have to be Pakistani and so no Olympics. Crazy. Crazy. Pakistan is home. And it's the myth of my existence going out for the entire day for a cricket match, walking for miles and miles to play the other team, playing and playing like Zaid Abbas, a titan of the cricket game. Zaid Abbas in that cover drive and me playing, running back, running full tilt to get back home before dark, before dark, because Karachi is home. It is where my mother and sister and I used to hunt for used trousers and shoes for us at the bazaar run by Afghan immigrants. Imagine that. And we were happy. Imagine a Turkish Pakistani immigrant wearing someone else's pants and shoes facilitated by Afghan refugees because we couldn't get new ones. And we were happy. Happy. Happy all those hours and hours when we had no electricity for hours. No running water for days. Keram, Keram, bring up the water with the bucket. Keram, watermelon guy is here. Can you go to the store and get some bread, Karam? There's curfew tomorrow because the riots are ongoing and the dictatorship has its knees in our throats and that suffocation burns and burns. Of course that's home. It burns thinking about those days because it was home. It is home. It's home because it's my blood, that fuel. And you think it's gone, then it's back. That is home. That That's the birds, the migrations, the hurts, the joys, this thing that shifts and turns and disappears and appears. And that burn licks because the Aegean coast of Turkey is also my home. I'm Turkish. My mother is now buried there. Her ancestral home is actually in Gaziantep near the Iraqi border. But she's now buried in Selçuk, access route of the Syrian refugees right at the foot of Ephesus. My mother is buried there at the sea which had the navies of the Ottoman and Greek empire sail. I couldn't bury my mother. I couldn't go see her. I couldn't go. COVID. I couldn't go and bury her. That is when you know someone in some place is your home because your soul roars and roars and roars for you to get there and you just can't, you just can't. My sister's in Australia, my dearest sister who I haven't seen in person over 10 years. The distance, is Australia home? And yes, Maine is home, it is. But so is the Aegean where the olive grows by St. John's Church and Selchuk look over the plateaus into the sea. My kids have been there. The bright days, oh, the bright and hot days in my mother's garden in Selchuk. I think wherever your mother plants roses and starts talking to them, it's home to you. It's home because the kebab is really good. The Nazim Hikmet Boim poems burn and burn. The Gaziantep Lamajun, essentially Turkish leavened bread with minced beef and spices, is the best. That's why it's home. So it is the home because of the food. And so about the roadside vendors in Karachi, the lentils, the freshly pressed sugarcane juice, but you know, that is home because we talk with our hands. I talk with my hands very loudly. We cry because a person singing the torch ballad went up in flames singing the song and sacrificed himself and herself for the song. Think Eddie Vedder meets Chris Isaac meets Sinatra meets Meatloaf meets Fiddler on the Roof. Zeki Miren, transgender human being who could sing the heavens down to earth. And speaking of heaven, grand Hollywood movies, grand films, where movies seep into your soul. That is where home is. And interestingly, that's how United States probably whispered into my DNA, which is why I absolutely adore movies, absolutely adore them. Watch Interstellar, please do. It is about home, my home. Sometimes it's a dream. And there are things that aren't a dream because it's a reality. St. John's University, this Muslim kid from Karachi in a Catholic college in Minnesota, then University of New Hampshire. Meeting my wife, my soulmate, that roots you, that roots you because when you say you want to create a life together with another human being, the earth that is under your feet becomes home, just like the mountains. In my case, White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire, US of A is my home. The beaches here in Maine is my home. The yard where I chase my kids is my home. The life I've tried to claw and cling is my home. Claw and cling, claw and cling, sing and cling. It is in that claw and cling in the singing that life gets made. When people spit at you, slap at you, tell you to go home, they did all of that to me again and again. The bone in my ribcage is etched to the marrow with those cuts. What is home? They tell you to go home. You bear down and say, wherever is at the root of my feet is home. I tell you, where is my home? This is my home. Home is where I love. Home is where I don't need to choose between you and me and us and them. Home is where my being gets invited to the clearing like it did at Canyonlands National Park and it accepts and it lives with all the pain and the joy and the music and words is where we belong to each other. That is my home. 
Do you hear me? That is my home, our home. And it's not just one home, it's not just one place. This is a lament, home is a lament, this witness. I feel there's something sacred about the lives we lead, this constant seeking, this constant desire to belong, this constant direction towards love and grace. So where are those things? Is where that's home for me? That's a secret combination of love and grace. And that never ends. It never culminates. It's a light beam, something eternal, something beautiful, something so very pure. A sunbeam I try to gather in my hands. Chris Christopherson singing, my heart was the last one to know. That is my home. My home in my hands. My home in my hands. Thank you, Karim. Thank you so much. Oh, just uh, feeling the after waves of that full presentation. So many images and textures and smells. Thank you. What a night. What a night of stories underneath the stories, the stories we would never hear. We never do hear if we don't ask, if we don't open ourselves up to each other's experience and listen. I am so honored to have been here to uh, honor each of our presenters' stories and that you were here with us live listening. Thank you for being here. We want to extend another special thank you to the Greater Portland Immigrant Welcome Center and the Executive Director Reza Jalali for the important work they do right here in Portland, Maine to make Greater Portland even greater. They were a tremendous contribution to tonight's event by introducing us to so many of our fabulous, inspiring presenters. I also want to thank Greg Bullis and family, Greater Good Marketing, Avenue Media, the NIA Technique, Klein Dytham Architects, and Creative Portland. All of these sponsors are hugely important to airing Pachakacha, to getting us in live venues when we're able to do that again. And we really want you to know that you can be our next presenter. We are always looking for courageous and passionate individuals to step up to the podium and tell their story, to share their passion. And our presenters always tell us that they get so much from distilling and honing their presentation down into this 20 by 20 format. We encourage you to step up. You never know what you'll learn about your own passion, about your own story, by going through this process with one of our mentors. PK Portland would not be around if it weren't for our generous volunteer board. Thank you to all the members of our board. <laughs> and join us online at pechacuchaportland.org where you can learn how to connect as a sponsor, as a presenter. We hope that you're inspired by the presentations tonight and that you'll stay inspired to listen to ask more questions, to be curious about your neighbors, your colleagues, your friends, people you haven't met yet. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us tonight and be well, stay safe, stay curious. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.